Uh, hi, my name's Ellen Harris. I'm hoping to give you some commentary about what you're about to hear. You will be, I think, most of you introduced to the Dragon of Wantley this afternoon. Um, the Dragon has a, a short history before uh, it was produced by John Frederick Lampe and Henry Carey in 1737. It was first published in 1695 as a ballad, The Dragon of Wantcliffe. Um, it was then uh, anthologized repeatedly. The story obviously is, to some extent, an irreverent take on the story of St. George and the Dragon, which he is the national patron saint of England, also famous for killing a dragon. And so the Dragon of Wantley is a kind of irreverent national story, and I think that's one way of looking at it. Um, when it was anthologized, it was anthologized uh, a number of times, but most importantly in 1723 by Ambrose Phillips. And it was included at that point among other national uh, dragon stories or hero stories. Um, so in that anthology, you get St. George and the Dragon. Then the next thing in the anthology is the seven champions of Christendom. And the seven champions of Christendom are St. George and the Dragon, St. Patrick, of course, the national saint of Ireland, St. David, the national patron saint of Wales, and St. Andrew, the national patron saint of Scotland, along with France, Spain, and Portugal to round out the seven. So again, again, this same context, and then the very next thing in the anthology is the Dragon of Wantley. So the Dragon of Wantley is right in there with St. George, St. Andrew, St. David, St. Patrick, and you understand that it is somewhat of a joke. There is actually, in the direction of the show today, there is a reference to that um, toward the end, which I won't give away entirely, but I think you will recognize an, an iconic image from a different show nationalized into Great Britain. Um, and it's quite funny in the context of the Dragon of Wantley and that national background. Henry Carey, in his introduction to the, uh, to the libretto, which was published in 1737, gives another potential history for this story which sounds a little bit Gilbert and Sullivan-ish to me, but what he says is historically, there were three children who were orphans, who were given to a solicitor as their guardian. The solicitor was able to discover uh, a way in which to usurp their titles and their estate, which he did, and the children were then given over to the parish to be taken care of in the poorhouse, at which point Sir Moore of Moorhall, who is of course the hero of the Dragon of Wantley, um, is able to um, correct the situation, uh, uh, to, to um, punish the solicitor, and to get the children back their estates. Um, I'm not convinced that this is actually a history and not also a folktale. However, the first story, the first aria one gets in the opera, is about the dragon eating three children. <laughs> and it is, strange to say, one of the funniest arias in the opera, which you wouldn't imagine, um, but uh, it is, well, I can, Actually, some of the text that Carey uses comes absolutely word for word from the ballad of 1695. He makes no changes whatsoever. And this is true of that first aria. And the first aria text is, poor children three devoured he that could not with him grapple. And at one sup, he eat him up as one would eat an apple. So, you can't even begin to imagine what this sounds like set to an aria. <laughs> but you will enjoy it. Let me tell you the story of the opera itself. 
um, and the characters. There's Gubbins. Gubbins is a kind of mayoral figure of this town of Warncliffe, or Wantley, and his daughter, Marjorie. Another woman, Moxalinda, and Mox is a slang word for prostitute. So you must, should keep that in mind. Um, we also have, of course, the Moor, uh, who is the hero of the opera. He is an entrenched alcoholic, but other than that, that he is heroic. So that is essentially, those are the characters. And what happens is that the townspeople decide that they need to go and find some way to deal with this dragon who is doing such horrific things as breaking into people's homes and eating their toast and butter. <laughs> that becomes a horror chorus, as you can imagine. Uh, they decide, Marjorie, who's the smart one among them, says, well, I think the best idea is let's kill him. And they decide that's a good idea, and they have to figure out who. And the suggestion is made of Sir Moore, Sir Moore of Moorhall. Um, and Moxalinda immediately agrees that he's the one, at which point we get the castrato joke, because um, there had to be a castrato joke in this opera, uh, when she then proceeds to sing an aria that is, he's a man every inch, I assure you. I'm telling you, giving this talk is a little difficult in places. <laughs> but you have to bear with me because I'm not making it up. So, But I did want you to know that it was actually a castrato joke. There are no castrati in this opera, obviously, and that's part of it being an English opera. And so you have to make fun of the castrato singers who are in the Italian operas. It's often described as a critique of Handel, and in some ways it is, but in more generic terms, it's a critique of Italian opera, which the English had been critiquing since the day it arrived on the shores of London in the uh, sort of uh, the 17 aughts, basically. Handel's first Italian opera for London was Rinaldo in 1711, and Joseph Addison went crazy over it because he was so disturbed, he did not want this, this foreign uh, import in his city, and he, of course, had just written an English opera, which was not successful. So uh, he wrote about Rinaldo, he made stuff up about what was wrong with it. He said that during the bird aria, they released sparrows into the theater, and this was a problem because then they came in and sang in places where they weren't wanted. They also were a problem for the ladies because they came and sat in their flower hats and various other things. None of this, of course, happened, but he loved telling stories about everything going wrong in Italian opera. He then suggested that instead that the English should be doing operas based on folk stories. And he suggests, as a good idea, Whittington and his cat. But when he thinks a little more about that, says, no, that won't work because, of course, there will be a problem with the mice afterwards. <laughs> so um, that is the kind of thing that is happening every time a, a Handel opera or Baroque opera is performed, there is resistance to it from the English faction who want to have a national opera. In 1724, with the opera Giulio Cesare, one of Handel's most famous operas, there was a screed written afterwards that with all these Italian singers singing in Italian, who knew what they were singing? And they gave you translations, but who knows? Maybe the translations aren't real. And maybe what they're doing is actually singing the Catholic Mass. <laughs> because, in fact, the Italian singers were Catholic. And this was an issue with the Catholic Protestant division at this time. The Hanoverian kings only became king because they needed to find a Protestant successor. And the Protest first Protestant successor in the line of succession was number 52. And that's when the Hanoverians came over. We still have them, by the way. So um, the issue of Italian singing, uh, the issue of castrati, all these things created, I think, jokes. I think even the thing about singing the mass is a joke, but of course presented deadpan and 
best comedy is presented deadpan. The, the creators and the singers of this opera were all very close associates of Handel. And I think Handel loved the joke. We don't have anything from Handel saying, I loved the joke. But there are letters written for people who knew Handel, who were at the opera, who say, Handel was at the Dragon of Wantley, and he enjoyed it mightily. And I think, it, of course he would. Handel, there are two characteristics of Handel that we know very well. He had a really sharp temper and a really deep sense of humor. So uh, this really tickled him. I think he found it very funny. I suspect you will as well. But let me just go down this list because it is astounding. Beginning with Lampe, who is the composer, bear in mind Lampe is also a German. So we have a German who is actually the leading composer of Italian music, and we have another German who is in the English opera camp. You wonder sort of how this all happened. Of course, the composer who put together the music for the Beggar's Opera, Pepusch, is also German. So uh, national opera, you have to, German is national at this point, given that the kings were also German. Um, so Lampe is German, but he was the major bassoonist in Handel's orchestra. So he played in all of Handel's operas before and after the Dragon of Wantley. So he was a very close associate of Handel. Thomas Reinhold, who played the dragon, was in Handel's, all of Handel's operas that year. He sang as a soloist in Arminio, in Justinio, and in Berenice before the Dragon of Wantley the same year. And he later performed as the bass soloist in the first London performance of Messiah, among many other works. And I just, you know, Handel would not go to someone if he really felt that he had been made fun of by Thomas Reinhold, he instead uses him in Messiah of all works. Uh, Thomas Salway, who plays the Moor, first began singing as a treble at Canons under Pepusch, and Canons is where Asus and Galatea was first performed. So he would have had knowledge of Asus and Galatea at its first performance in Canons. Bear that in mind, because that will come back. Um, and in fact, he sang the role of Damon from Asus and Galatea in the first London performance of Asus and Galatea. Um, John Laguerre, who sang Gubbins, sang Curio in Giulio Cesare, he also sang uh, Corridon in the first London performance of Asus and Galatea. So you have both Damon and Corridon from Asus and Galatea in this performance. Um, finally, we have Isabella Young, uh, who in the course of the production married Lampe and afterwards sang only for Lampe. <laughs> and then Esther Young, who sings Moxalinda, who is the prostitute. Handel later chose her to premiere the role of Juno in Semele. So um, this is an in-group of people who are having a really good time understanding what is funny about this. And I think that's important to bear in mind as we talk more about the story. A publication in 1728 by a man, it's attributed to a man, James Ralph, and it may in fact not be by him, but that is the name that is associated with it, called The Taste of the Town, talks about what kinds of operas the English opera company should be producing. And he goes through a number, and he goes through, you know, he gives you Whittington and his cat and all the ones you would expect. And then he gives you the Dragon of Wantley. He then describes how this opera would work. This is 1728, and I want to read the description of how this opera would work. He says, in the first act, you have a chorus of men, women, and children whose bread and butter, milk pottage, or relations, the dragon has devoured. I'm glad you got that. I do think it's wonderful. You know, bread and butter, pottage, or relations. The dragon has devoured, accompanied by a suitable noise of sobs, sighs, and groans on proper instruments, which must have a fine effect, as to moving pity. These lamentations rousing up the dormant spirit of the moor, he declares for the combat, which naturally ushers in the second act. 
with a chorus of warlike instruments on his part, preparative to the battle, joined to a complete roar on the part of the dragon, which must exhibit terror to a vast degree. And then the third act, beginning with the combat, concludes nobly with the dragon's death and a grand chorus of the whole company. This is exactly the layout of Carey's opera when he writes the libretto. So again, you just see all these historical factors coming to play um, and so many people involved in this and making it happen. I want to go back to uh, some of the texts because I've mentioned Asus and Galatea and the Moor has a love song that he sings and the Moor's love song goes, by the beer as brown as berry, by the cider and the perry, which so often has made us merry, with a high down, ho down dairy, Moxalinda I'll remain, true blue will never stain. And then, um, that there's a decapo. So you go back to by the beer as brown as berry. Now, for me, this is Polyphemus's aria in Asus and Galatea, take off on it the aria, oh ruddier than the cherry, oh sweeter than the berry. But here we have by the beer, as brown as berry, and so forth. Um, and I do think all those people who were performing in Asus and Galatea would have understood some of these jokes. I also think that the death recitative of the dragon is very reminiscent of the death recitative of Asus. And then there is the inimitable love duet, uh, which is, pigs shall not be so fond as we. <laughs> and I think probably that's related to the flock shall leave the mountains. In fact, we get on to flocks in that, um, <clears throat> we get on to turtle doves fondly cooing and still enjoying sporting sparrows we will outdo and so forth. So you get the sparrows, the sort of, from Handel's Rinaldo, you get the turtle doves from Asus and Galatea, but in fact, it begins with sporting pigs. So again, this really funny takeoff on some of these pastoral images that you get in Asus and Galatea um, as you get through the opera. Now, in the exact context of the time in the 1730s, there's another issue which I think is enormously important, and that, um, we need to discuss, which has to do with, in 1732, there was a huge crisis with Sir Robert Walpole and the excise tax, and he put an excise tax on tobacco and various other products that were very desirable to the population, and there was an outrage and a great deal of revolt and criticism. And in fact, in the criticism and in, of course, the political caricatures, which were very popular in the day, Sir Robert Walpole is frequently depicted as a dragon gobbling up everything, like everything uh, from the table, leaving children with nothing to eat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One really famous cartoon has him in a cart being driven by a dragon who is eating everything up and then throwing it back into Sir Robert Walpole's pouch. Um, so the, this opera was probably written around 1734, because it was given into Covent Garden a few years before it was performed in Lay Dormant. So it isn't related directly to what was going on in 1737, but a little earlier. And it seems to me that with all of the political things going on at this time, that it is related in part to Sir Robert Walpole as the dragon. And the idea that the dragon gets, and he dies this way, and forgive me again, because I cannot say it any other way, but he basically gets a kick in the ass, and that kills him. He has a very sensitive point, which I will not mention, which is, using a different anatomy, his Achilles heel. So uh, that is how the Moor kills him, and his death song is all about, oh, Moor, you son of a whore, which has a nice melisma on it, um, and then, oh, your toe, your toe, your toe, anyway. So, uh, as I say, I'm not going into any more detail on that. Also, in 1732, Handel had a new thing. He did oratorio for the first time publicly in London 
and he wrote a new oratorio called Deborah. And this is how it's described in the criticism uh, of the time. Handel thinking he, this is actually, it, Handel's Deborah is seen as a direct response to Lampe and Carré's Amelia, an English opera. 1732 was a really big year for the English opera faction to put on operas. And so operas by Thomas Arne, by J.C. Uh, Smith, by Lampe were all put on in 1732-1733. Amelia was produced in 1732, was successful, and people actually believed that Handel put on his oratorio of Deborah in opposition to the English opera, because of course it's in English. This is, you know, Handel's beginning to produce new works in English at this time. So they say, Handel thinking he had a new thing to offer raised prices, his audience rebelled, and he was forced to accept subscription tickets without surcharge. In writings and caricatures of the time, Handel attempted ticket extortion, is what it's called in the uh, press at the time. The performance of Carrie and Lampe's Amelia in 1732 alarmed Handel, and out he brings an oratorio. This being a new thing set the whole world a madding. Hadn't you been at the oratorio, says one? Oh, if you don't see the oratorio, you see nothing, says the other. So away I goes to the oratorio. Handel sat next to Senesino, Strada, Bertoli, and Turner Robinson, and Strada gave us a hallelujah of half an hour long. Senesino and Bertoli made rare work with the English tongue. You would have sworn it had been Welsh. I would have wished it Italian that they might have sung with more ease to themselves, since, but for the name of English, it might have been Hebrew. <laughs> this is another thing about making fun of the Italian singers at this point. But Handel at this point, because of his raising the ticket prices, extorting his audience, insisting that the silver ticket holders had to pay a surcharge, was compared to Sir Robert Walpole. And both Walpole and Handel extorting the country and getting extra money out of them, and therefore rapacious dragons, both of them. The person who is best known for actually kicking people in the bum, unbelievably, was George II. Was known when he was unhappy with someone either to kick them or to turn his own back on them. And so one of the stories of the Dragon of Wantley is that what is happening is Sir Robert Walpole being rapacious around the country, eating up people's bread and butter with the excise tax, that George II, in the character of the drunkard Sir Moore of Moorhall, gives him a kick in the bun and actually says, no more of this. That's what the people wanted, and it's sort of the idea. Maybe Handel also stopped charging surcharges. The reason that I think this is important, in particular, is that the final chorus of the Dragon of Wantley goes like this. Sing, sing, and Rorio, and Oratorio. <laughs> to gallant Morio of Moore Hall. So the end of this story is we need to create an oratorio for Sir Moore of Moore Hall. Um, so again, the oratorio comes into this and the whole idea of this becoming an oratorio. And then because they're talking about oratorios, rather than having a hallelujah chorus or an amen chorus, Handel's famous for both, they have a final chorus, a huzzahs. So they have a huzzahs chorus. And you know, it's not really as easy to sing as amen or hallelujah. But they do it. They manage to sing an entire chorus of huzzahs. So let me just give you just a minute about uh, some of the things that are happening and in the order so that you have some sense of this, because I've done some things out of place. Um, there is, of course, an overture. And then you have the R, Your Poor Children 3, that I read to you. Um, and after that, Fly, fly, neighbors fly. This is one of the first choruses, and the choruses, just like Handel's Israelite choruses, are fugal. So there are these wonderful choral fugues, um, which <clears throat> I think you will also love. And moving on, also 
this is a completely through composed opera, and so all the recitative is sung. So it's not like the ballad opera where there's actually spoken text. This is actually an all sung opera, so you will hear recitative. Most of the arias are in da capo form, which is the Handel opera aria form. Um, there are really ridiculous melismas, which just are a great deal of fun. Well, that's when you have lots of notes on a single word. It's, for example, the dragon gets a long melisma on the word whore. Uh, there is the castrato referent, which I think is important to bear in mind. Wonderful oboe obligatos all the way throughout. Uh, and a real sense, I mean, Lampi's a real composer. Um, one of the comparisons I like to make is between Lampe and Peter Schickele. Um, the whole idea of Peter Kubach, and if any of you have heard Iphigenia in Brooklyn, which is one of his best works, which is a Baroque cantata about Iphigenia, and Orestes sings how difficult it is to be running, only he who is running knows, that's his recitative, and then that leads into an aria on the words running knows. <laughs> and this is so similar to what Carey and Lampe are doing, and the kind of fun that they are having. Um, also, Moore's very first aria is Zeno, Plato, Aristotle, all were friendly with the bottle, <laughs> um, is in fact something that some of you may know from Monty Python, because the philosopher's song in fact does the Aristotle bottle rhyme, which in fact has been used a number of times. Um, I'm not suggesting that the Monty Python crew knew the Dragon of Wantley, but all I can say is the Dragon of Wantley got there first <laughs> with Aristotle and the bottle. Um, and we go on. The, um, what Moore says is that he will kill the dragon if he basically gets Marjorie for whatever, and she thinks that's just fine. And she sings to him, if that's all you ask, my sweetest, my feet is completest and neatest. And that's really a wonderful aria also. Then there's a love duet about killing the dragon, if you can imagine. Uh, and uh, the uh, act one ends with the lovely love duet, pigs shall not be so fond as we. And then the, the, act two begins with a lament aria and it's oboe obligato. You know exactly where you are. You can hear the lament. You know exactly what you're going to get. And then what the singer sings is, oh, I think my stays will burst with sobbing. So I mean, I was thinking, I think every soprano probably at that time worried about her stays, but to sing about her corset, in effect. Um, and that's her lament is so, um, but it's gorgeous. I mean, that's the thing that's really amazing about it. Um, Moxelinda and uh, Marjorie in the second act get into sort of fisticuffs on the stage. And this, of course, is depicting Handel's famous prima donnas from the 1720s, Faustina and Cuzzoni, who were reputed to have actually gotten into fisticuffs, which they didn't. I think Handel would have loved this because he was glad to see them go. Um, and he didn't have them in the 1730s, he did not use them at all. So. Um, I, I don't think that that was offensive to him, but it really is obviously a specific depiction. And then in Act Three, we get actually uh, the bravura aria, Dragon, Dragon, Thus I Dare Thee. We get a battle symphony, of course, and we get the death scene for the dragon, and then a final love duet, and then, oh, we need to make this an oratorio, and a huzzah chorus at the end. I, <laughs> I want to end with just one quote from Carey's um, preface to his libretto, which I think is essential, and that's the only thing that you really need to know is part of what he says in the preface. He says, the gay, the good-natured, and the jocular part of mankind have tasted the joke and enjoyed the laugh, while the morose, superstitious, and asinine say, tis low, very low. Now." Begging their worship's pardon, I affirm it to be sublime, very sublime. It is a burlesque opera, and burlesque cannot be too low. <laughs> Lowness, figuratively speaking, 
is the sublimity of burlesque. <laughs> if so, this opera is, consequently, the tip-top sublime of its kind. <laughs> Thank you. If anyone has any questions, I'll try to answer one or two. If you have a burning question, any burning questions, then just sit back and relax and enjoy. Thank you.